unfortunately although it is not something that is known but a lot of these different aspects of our culture and our histories can go all the way back into that time of the maritime silk road for example less than 100 years ago one of the main um, areas of business export in parts of the persian gulf and the middle east was pearls and pearl diving and one of the people that completely revolutionized pearl diving was a man in Japan. I forgot his name, but he was a Japanese scientist and he discovered how to create artificial pearls. And when that happened, when he managed to do that, he put an end to the pearl trade that happened between Arabia and Africa and India. So how something all the way in East Asia led to a domino effect that completely halted the pearl trade and the pearl diving expeditions through maritime means and the Silk Road between East Africa, Arabia and South Asia as well as all the way up in Iran. So yeah, there's just so much to talk about. I learned something new today because I, <clears throat> when you talk about the latest iteration, uh, it's important to, to emphasize it. It is the latest iteration because as you say, there has always been trade going on for thousands of years. I, I mean, I, I, I don't people like to say globalization 1.0, 2.0. I actually work more like globalization maybe like 2000 <laughs> you know like because there have been many rounds of globalization that went out exactly. before us before the europeans intruded upon the indian ocean basin but i was surprised to learn that the the omani um uh, uh arrival on the east african coast actually arrived after the portuguese i i, I was i i just assumed they were always there because you know it, they're much closer and and uh, but 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 it does make sense, and and it, it also um, it's how interesting kind of like the butterfly effect of you know the Portuguese intrusion into the Gulf and 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 trigger a, a, a unintended a bunch of unintended consequences where you you brought, which brought the Afri Arabs once again to the East African coast. And and talk, just talking about East African coast, I have to mention Madagascar again because. The, the people in Madagascar started thousand years ago, and it started with a, a tribe in present-day present Borneo, which is like present-day Indonesia, and these Austronesian-speaking people, they sail all the way across the Indian Ocean to settle on Madagascar, the, the biggest island off the coast of Africa. This this happened before writing, you know, prehistory. It's quite amazing. And, and even the Austronesian people themselves, they... So originally came from mainland China and they went to Taiwan and then from Taiwan went down to Philippines, Indonesia, and then uh, to Polynesia to 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 not only they not only they went west to Madagascar, but also they went east to New Zealand, to to Hawaii. I mean, it, it's it's just a fascinating, uh, a, a fascinating like. There's just so much to talk about. I totally agree with you. I'm so excited I, you 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 reach out to me. <laughs> so yeah, so let, so let, let, let we can I can geek out on this for uh, you know for hours. So let's go, let's go. <laughs> so what should we even? Talk, which part of the world should we talk about now in the Indian Ocean? Because there's just so much to talk about. As no, we were saying, no. but, yeah. I, I I agree, I agree. So I, I how about I will in, bring the lens back to further east start from China and then you jump in whenever you feel like it and because we can like make this a free flowing uh, information exchange, you know, like uh, this is our informational Silk Road on the internet. <laughs> Virtual <laughs> not, not Silk the, Road. Yeah, not the one that sells drugs. Okay, not not that Silk Road. <laughs> no. Okay, okay. So um, like the, the, the name Silk Road was actually coined by a German explorer in the 19th century. Uh, you know, like like in China before 19th century, people, you know, people didn't necessarily name that the, these ancient linkages always existed. But um, the, the, the German guy, he's actually the uncle of the Red Baron, the, the German ace pilot. Uh, uh, he he went to China and he did a bunch of traveling. He coined the term Silk Road. Um, but again, there's not one road, right? As you mentioned, there's many, many routes. And in fact, I would even argue the, the, the Maritime Silk Road is as important, if not more important than the land, land uh, links, because sh shipping over water just have such a major advantage 
over uh, shipping over land because you can carry more more merchandise in your exactly. ship, and 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 it, it allows you to travel. You know, whereas you know, if you travel by camels, you have to feed the camel, you have to bring water <laughs> on the ships. You can stay on the ship a month, and and as long as you have harbor, have ports along the way, which are these linkages that that these ports really is what linked up all these uh the different continents together, and then you can you can just like and 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 there's a very peculiar phenomenon. In in the in the Asia and also in um, Indian Ocean Basin, it's a monsoon. So mm -hmm. and the, the travelers have discovered the monsoon very early on. And the effect of the monsoon is well, one half the year the wind will blow one way, and then then yeah. another six months the wind will, will reverse. So this is also called a trade wind. So what you can do is you can when the wind start uh, blowing from say northeast to south uh, southwest then you can launch the ship from china down the south china sea to um to to sumatra to to malacca and then uh, you you wait for the wind to change and the, the, the other direction you you sail to to the indian ports and then you you again you 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 just you just you you do some trade for like 6 months and spend some time for six months, and then you load up your merchandise and you you go home when the when the wind changes. Uh, and that this is, uh, um, I think that that also made like made it easier for this marine time uh, linkage from a very early early on because the people of the Indian Ocean Basin understood the patterns of of the monsoon very early, and. And uh, what I wanted to say, uh, you feel free to jump in anytime. I'm just, I'm just going off the cuffs. <laughs> That's okay. so interesting because I'm also learning different things from you. But yeah, like uh, what you just said reminded me of something very interesting when you talked about the monsoon patterns, because this is something as well that a lot of people don't know, because you did have this very interesting phenomenon of wind, rain, and this wave formation that essentially pushed people to go from one side to the other. And when people want to adopt this to a global view, they even can see this in the West and the Atlantic Ocean. This happens as well. Like when people were trading during the transatlantic slave trade, there were parts of West Africa that were pushing boats directly to go to North America. Whereas if you went 100, 200 miles south, it was pushing boats to the other side of the world all the way to South America. So it depended. You see, so the, the sea was affected by so many different currents, was affected by weather patterns. And when people, for example, during the Indian Ocean trade or the Maritime Silk Road were trading, from Arabia to Southeast Asia to South Asia to East Africa, like you said, they would stay for six months in six months in one place, and they would many times they would mix with the local populations. Many times they would get second or third wives. That's something that I saw as well, and that's how different identities mixed over time. And that's how you see the Arab input in East Africa. That's how you see the Indian input that arrived in the islands of Sumatra and the islands of Borneo and so many different areas of Southeast Asia as well. And that's how empires expanded over periods of time because they were like okay that's interesting i was there for six months they have these resources we don't have them we can trade them and that's what they were doing because this is how uh islam first came to china it's by sea the, because they exactly. came up the south china sea and they, that's where they landed in the very important port city of guangzhou that's where the first mosque was built and and that's most how the 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 Muslim community on the coastal China first came about. All these Arab Persian traders that came in, they settle for six months, they take local wives, and next thing you know, there's a community, there's a there's a vibrant uh, a Muslim community in these parts, which you know stretch back thousands of years to the early days of Islam. And, exactly. And and yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's and and like as you say, this is like a very um, and and on the coastal. Also, it's very interesting this uh, mixture on the coastal China because you will have, um, um, you know, people who, you know, they're they're Muslims, right? So you know, you can't you can't do an ancestor worship anymore, <laughs> but but like but like they still very conscious of their lineage, right? Mm -hmm. Just like any other Chinese clans, they they have a very like record. That's why we have very good documentation because they have they keep records. Of their mm -hmm. their lineage of their family going all the way to like maybe the first Muslim ancestor who set foot on on the on the on the shore of Guangzhou or Fuzhou um, and of course some some 
um, it, which is which is interesting because there was a famous Confucian scholar uh, during the Ming Dynasty. Um, he is he is coming from he, he he himself came from one such family, but there was like a split in his family. Um, so originally there were two brothers. One brother, uh, like this is predates him several hundred years ago, maybe back in the days of the Mongol Empire. So what the older brother took to the sea to, 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 to trade, to go to the Indian Ocean trade. And then he took a wife in, uh, in the Persian Gulf. And so he, he converted to Islam to marry his wife, of course. So when he came back to China, he, he's a Muslim and he started his clan, his side of the clan become the Muslim clan. But he's his younger brother, um, you know, stuck to the Chinese tradition. And and then there was always kind of like this, their, their family, but there's also a little bit of tension between the between the two sides of the family because of the because of the choice of religion. Uh, but the the writer, uh, this famous Confucian scholar himself, he came from the Muslim side of the family. But he at some point he, he made a switch. He decided to join the other side of the family. <laughs> so he was writing. The, um, he actually wrote this whole thing about like criticizing his ancestor. Uh, you know, why did he go, go to the foreign land, uh, marry a foreign wife? And uh, this is like so disrespectful for your ancestors. But it's kind of odd because he's posing, he's structuring like a kind of the Confucian critiques, like, you know, how do you forget your ancestor and stuff? But then he's talking about his own ancestor who is, you know, without <laughs> his ancestor. Yeah, exactly. Without his ancestor travel to Persian Gulf, he wouldn't have existed. Um, exactly. So this, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a very interesting like contradiction. Uh, crap. I don't know. I forgot his name off the top of my head. Uh, but he was he was a very famous uh, Confucian scholar in the late Ming era. But at the same time, himself was not an orthodox Confucian because maybe it's because his Muslim background. You know, he's always uh, uh, he was always a contrarian, and uh, and 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 I think this is how um, like the the spice, the spice trade or the silk trade kind of added to the different mixture of cultures and, and into a previous like I because I, because before the 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 the, the um, before the arrival of Islam on the on the coast of China, it's a quite different. It's quite different. I mean, the arrival of Islam drastically changed Southeast Asia in, in, in parts of Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, the, those areas used to be much more um, Hindu and Buddhist. And, and but the uh, but the when the Muslim merchant brought Islam to this part, and it's very important to stress this, uh, this the, the, the Islamization of Southeast Asia did not come by conquest. It came by trade. It came by trade. And 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 it's the, the local rulers who saw there's advan some advantage in converting to Islam and then brought all their people over. And then next thing you know, it's like a domino effect. And then the whole of the, you know, the, much of the Southeast Asia, maritime Southeast Asia, uh, I'm talking about present day Malaysia, Indonesia is all uh, Muslim. And, and at one point, the, the, the Muslim kingdom stretch as far as the, the Philippines. Um, you know, th th actually, they arrived in um, the northern part of the Philippines before arrival of the Spanish. Um, you know, but of course, you know, Spanish came and they, you know, they do, did their own conquests and uh, colonization. But the south, that's why the southern tip of the Philippines is still very, very Muslim. Yeah. Um, that's uh, which leads to like there's still a little bit tension over there because there's uh, some. Some people want independence, um, and and there's there's a bit of a conflict with <clears throat> with the Philippine government because the Philippine itself is a, is a now a Catholic majority country, and whereas the south of the country uh, of the Philippines is very different culturally, they they have a, a long tie, a, a long established like um, Muslim Sultanate in the the Sultanate of Sulu, mm -hmm. which which itself has a very close tie with the Ming Dynasty in China. Um, 
But anyway, jump in. Don't don't let me hijack this conversation. No, 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 it's interesting because, <laughs> because what you're saying is just reminding me of something. Because yeah, like this whole history of Islam in Philippines as well is so lengthy. And I remember because that was one of my areas of focus as well when I was working on the history of Islamic expansion. Like the Philippines up until today in the south, the area of Mindanao is entirely Muslim. And I do know because here in my country in Bahrain, there's a huge Filipino community. And I grew up with Filipinos ever since I was a kid. And and that's probably one of the reasons why I speak Tagalog as well. But what's so interesting is that even within the Philippines, a country that is so diverse, you can see that there is a very shared history, but also a very mixed history. Because like you rightfully said as well with the Spanish, what's interesting with the Spanish is that if the, the Spanish had never arrived, especially in the northern tip of the Filipino archipelago, it is estimated that the Philippines would have been Muslim just like Indonesia or Malaysia because the southern tip of the country, the southwest, is entirely Muslim until today. And that culture is very close to the culture of, um, I mean, northeastern Indonesia as well, all of those islands. And like you rightfully said as well, this is why there is um, a separatist movement. There are lots of different identities that have started to emerge that are like, we want to be independent. And this is why you have also seen separatist groups like the Abu Sayyaf as well that have started to control the entire area, that have wanted to expand their scopes of power. And you even have a more ancient identity across the southern Philippines, which is very linked to the arrival of Islam that arrived with the Arabs, but then that had an impact on Malaysian and Indonesian societies that are called the Moro. Because the Moro, for example, comes from the word Moor. And if anybody knows about anything to do with Islamic history, all the way from Africa to the Middle East to Asia, even in Southern Europe, anything to do with the identity of Moor essentially stated that this person is a Muslim. It doesn't mean they're an Arab, but that means that they have something to do with the Muslim tradition. So as Islam expanded over a given period of time in different parts of the world, many people who wanted to reclaim that Islamic identity or something close to Islamic heritage would usually use the term Moor. This is something that we even see today in Sri Lanka, in, uh, which is an Island in a country in South Asia, where lots of people who are Muslim, they call themselves the Sri Lankan Moors. And they are Muslim Sri Lankans who have, it is estimated between 5% to 20, 30% Arab ancestry is not really that very well known. Some even have ancestry in Indonesia because Sri Lanka was known as the island of cinnamon. So when the Arabs began trading with um, Sri Lanka, essentially, you had the Indonesians that were arriving from the east, the Arabs were arriving from the west. And then with the Indian Ocean trade, you had people that were being shipped as well from Zanzibar in East Africa to South Asia, which is why we even see that there was a development of a pre-Islamic and a pre-modern kingdom in antiquity in Western India that had roots in East Africa as well as with Ethiopia, which is something that is so lengthy and so detailed, which is... Yeah, it's just it's just so complex because you see so many identities one over the other and you're like you had no idea that this country was also involved and no idea that this identity was involved. And over time, Islam became, despite the fact that it was not accepted everywhere, but it became like the religion of the Indian Ocean to a certain extent, because that was what different people across the Indian Ocean were adopting in order to increase their trade. And like you said, in Indonesia and in the Philippines, they were adopting it also for economic reasons, for trading reasons. And when the Yemenis and the Omanis arrived, they were merchants who arrived in Indonesia. And there, like you said as well, it wasn't by violence, it was by peaceful means, by trade. And there were many different kingdoms that were located in the islands of Indonesia. And you had rulers that had observed these Yemeni traders and they were thinking, these people are polite, they're acting in this way, what is their culture, what's their identity? So then they began to interact with them, they began to ask questions, and that's how people learned essentially different languages. Many Indonesians learned Arabic, you had Arabs that were learning Bahasa Indonesia and different uh, I, I, linguistic continuums. So this is how you have this shared identity that over time emerged and how people began adopting elements from another culture. And all of that was facilitated by trade, because if you didn't have the economic trade, that would have never happened. And even South Vietnam, people, many people might not know this, but in the, South, the present day South Vietnam, there used to be a kingdom called Champa. And, and Champa, just like the, uh, many others neighboring uh, Southeast Asian countries, started to adopt Islam. Um, so when when the when the the Vietnamese Empire finally came down from the north, absorbed Champa. Uh, by that time, Champa was already like half Hindu, half 
half Muslim, and many uh, uh, Changpa Muslims they fled um, uh, the the onset of the conquest, and they fled fled to the Chinese island of Hainan, Hainan Island. And and today, so this is how the Muslim community got, made their way to Hainan Island today. Like today in in China, anybody who is um, Muslim who is not like uh, the, the Turkic Muslim who have their still retained like the Turkic language and stuff is under group under this umbrella term Hui, right? Hui mm -hmm. is just, but in the, because in the old time Hui just applies to anybody who is Muslim, but mm -hmm. then. And, but now, now Hui is just um, anybody who is not like a Turkic Muslim. And, but but the but the people, for example, in Hainan Island, they they their their route is not you know they didn't come directly from the Arab and Persian traders. They came from South Vietnam. You know the the, the local Muslims of South Vietnam that made it over there. And also the Philippines, uh, the, the in the southern Philippines, there used to be the Sulu Sultanate. Um, and the Sasulu Sultanate, like many other East Asian polities, they maintain a very close relationship with Ming Dynasty China because of the trade. And one of the Sultan of Sulu, actually on his trip to uh, the Ming court in Beijing, he died and he actually left many of uh, his descendants in China. So, so there's like a different branches of Muslim mm -hmm. community in China that that you know, sprang up because of these kind of mixing uh, going on in South Asia. The, those descendants, they didn't originally come from like the Arabs uh, or the Persians. They came from, um, they came from the Philippines. <laughs> they came from the Philippines. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating. It is. And this just goes to show how all of these links to Islam and to uh, the legacy of Islam in Asia was not always directly linked to Arabs because the Arabs had created, like we said, a domino effect. But then that domino effect was being was in the hands of Asians as well, of East Asians, of Southeast Asians. So we, there was also a, an Islamic presence in Thailand and in Myanmar. And they went also by land and some of them went by sea as well. They used, they went east and then they went north again. And then they reached areas that are linked to China. And 